Hola everyone, I'm Anna, and this is the first video podcast of the project The Women Founders of Sociology. The project is financed by Fundación Pública Centro de Estudios Andaluces. The coordinator and lecturer is Dr. Maria José del Pino Espejo. Uh, I'm an Erasmus student studying uh, at Universidad Pablo de la Vida, but my home university is in Italy. Uh, in uh, University of Milano Bicocca. So this video is about, as you can see from the title, Harriet Martineau, a great woman and a great sociologist. Uh, I'd like to start off with a quote um, uh, that sums up pretty much her whole purpose in doing research and social analysis. The quote is, I believe myself possessed of no uncommon talents and of not an atom of genius, but I believe that I may so write on subjects of universal concern as to inform some minds and stir up others. So before explaining her sociological and econo economics ideas, let's dive into her life. So she was born in 1802 in Norwich, England. Uh, here you, you have a map uh, to let you know a little bit where the city is. Um, she lived in a big family. In fact, she was the sixth, sixth of eight children. An important aspect of her life is covered by religion. Her family was a Unitarian. So Unitarianism is a branch of Protestant religion that refused state religion, which is, if you recall, uh, Anglicanism. Uh, Unitarian people were not allowed to vote nor attend university. Uh, education was really important for them, even for women. And higher education was given at home since, you, since they were not allowed to attend university. Um, they prized standing up for your opinion regardless of public consequence. And reflection and rationality play a big role in Unitarianism. So this aspect played a major role in the development in the development of Martineau's as an intellectual. And we will see why throughout the whole presentation that you really can see how those values really affected her as an intellectual. So she suffered various illness since a young age. The most serious is a here problem, which eventually worsened into complete deafness. She lived in a middle class family. Her father was a textile manufacturer. An important turning point in her life uh, happened in, uh, in the 1820s when the Industrial Revolution happened. Um, that was a turning point because uh, the Industrial Revolution swept away her family business. In fact, Machine began to replace workers, putting his father's work work at risk. Um, in this scenario, political economy developed and became very relevant, uh, a very, revela, very revela, relevant <laughs> topic in the society, as well as in Martino's house. Um, so, to earn a living, she started writing fictional tales on economic issues. In 1832, she published her first volumes of Illustration of Political Economy, which is one of her masterpieces. Uh, another important aspect of her life is the travel to the USA for two years, doing public speeches and studying society and slavery especially. During this travel, she wrote another masterpiece, which is Society in America. Uh, this is her first book about social analysis, and she, in which she talks about abolitionism, women's rights, and other important topics. We're going we're gonna to see all of them in a few minutes. In 1853, she translated in English Auguste Comte's uh, main book, which is Positive Philosophy, from French to English. And she died in 1876 uh, at 74 years old. So now let's dive in into the economical and social progress part of the presentation. First thing you need to know is uh, that Martineau was a positivist. But what, what does uh, that exactly mean? So basically, positivism is a philosophical and scientific movement characterized, uh, among other elements, by its complete trust in science. 
positive intellectual thought that the whole universe uh, and its secrets can be discovered by mankind through empirical methods and experience that only science and the scientific method can assure. Science leads to, prog to progress and to well-being for the humankind. Secondly, we need to have cleared the concept of political economy because she wrote extensively about the subjects in her lifetime, as we saw. So basically, political economy is the study of economy and its relations with laws and government. In the field of political economy, there are two schools of thought in which Martinov vacillated between for her whole lifetime. The, for, the first school of thought stated that people need to, in, to be encouraged with rewards or punishment to align their action with the good of the society. If people, um, the second school of thought is the, um, stated that if people pursue their interests, the invisible hand of the market will produce the greatest good for the greatest amount. To do so, governments need to take a laissez-faire approach to the economy, which means uh, that the market self-regulates itself and the government doesn't have to intervene in economy. So in this second school of thought, basically economy and politics are two completely different branch, branches that don't, don't have to uh, that don't have to collaborate, that you don't have to um, interfere in one to another. Um, individual freedom was fundamental for Martino, but at the same time, she also was committed to the principle of equality. So she stated that equalization of properties and materials resources was necessary. So this, uh, as you can see, these two concepts, individual freedom and equality in the way she intended it, were a little bit struggling one to an with another. Um, okay, so. As we, as we said before, in 1832, she published her first volumes of illustration of political economy. Um, uh, so the first thing we need to know is that it's not uh, one book, but they were multiple volumes, multiple books. Each of them uh, explained uh, principles of political economy. Um, these books had great success. In fact, she eventually turned out 24 volumes in 24 months. That's great, that's amazing, that's really great. This really gives you an idea how, of the success she had. So each volume taught principle of political economy, but it was it, it, in a very original way. In fact, every book was in the form of tales. Um, tales were written with easy language, making it understandable by everyone. She educated tons of regular people outside the economics field, especially women, making economy a science for everyone. She wrote once the works which profess to teach uh, have been written for the learned and can only interest the learned. That, that is why she decided to write volumes that could interest and be learned by everyone. Another important uh, fact is that in 1833-1834, she sustained the reform of the so-called uh, poor laws. Those laws were in fact reformed in 1834, um, but the important thing we have to know about these laws is that they introduced uh, so they they've been existing for they existed for a long time, um, and they were the, they were responsible of introducing workhouses, which were an institution that was intended to provide work and home for poor people. People were made to work hard, uh, often doing unpleasant jobs, and children could also find themselves working in factories or mines. Um, so Martino, as we said, she supported the reform of poor laws because she, do she thought that uh, poor people were relying too much on charity instead of trying to find a new job. This sentence was later widely criticized because uh, Martino was, like, was accused of not really um, taking into account all factors that 
uh, let people uh, rely on charity instead of trying to find a job. This sentence was not true at all. Okay, let's see now how Harriet Mart Martineau was a social reformer. First of all, for Martineau, sociology is a critical science with the imperative to oppose to uh, domination. Domination is a, a central uh, aspect in her, in her sociology. So domination is the opposite of autonomy. Domination, domination is submission of one individual under one another. And domination is a social factor that limits individuals, uh, individuals from becoming uh, free agents. In her book, uh, How to Observe, Martino talks about three criteria that estimate the degree of domination within a society. These criteria are, first of all, condition of the less powerful, and by less powerful we mean women, prisoner, prisoners, and those in need of charity. Second criteria is society's idea of liberty that shows attitudes towards authority and autonomy. And the third rule is if the society provides equal means for all to become moral agents. She tested those criteria on American society uh, and talks about it in her book, which we saw previously, uh, Society in America. In Society in America, she talks about the four practices of domination, which are slavery, treatment of women, reification of public speech, and fetishizing of, fetishizing of wealth. Society in America, as we said previously, is a book about social analysis. Inside, we find original themes for the, for the times, such as racial equality, emancipation of slaves, and abolitionism, um, this point is really important because she was widely criticized for that in America. When the book first came out, uh, it didn't have a lot of success because it showed new topics that had never been dealt with before uh, and which went against the majority of uh, opinion. The book also, taught, uh, also talked about women's rights and equalization of property. In uh, The Morals of Slavery, which is one of the chapters of the book Society in America, she, tra she tries to justify slavery as a complex relation uh, between morals and manners in a society ruled by injustice. Uh, in this chapter, she focuses on influence of slavery, on sexuality and marriage. This analysis is surprisingly, surprisingly original because comprehend intersectionality. So it means that she studies both the blacks and the whites implication, talking about sexual exploitation by white males over black, over black females, attraction between races, exploitation of black men and impotence of white women. The chapter draws a comparison between slavery and domination of, um, of women. Women, as, uh, as well as slaves, can be treated by men with indulgence, kindness, benevolence, but that is given only as a substitute of justice and, and, and um, equality. Another topic that was really dear to her is Americans' self-censorship. So she thought that Americans, uh, Americans have fear of public opinion. She said that, for instance, the majority of people see that slavery is bad uh, and unfair, but they are scared to say it out loud because they would go against the union. The union was the main, uh, was like the main political, uh, was like, the organization that held the power at that time and that was uh, in favor of uh, slavery. So the majority of Americans, even though they were against it, um, didn't were afraid to say so because of going against the powerful party, uh, the powerful party of the country. Um, that's why she stated that rules don't always get along with majority. 
Another important analysis is Americans' frenetic pursuit of wealth. This aspect leads to domination in two ways. First of all, it produces stratification. Uh, wealth is power, and power is given only to a few people, specifically white, ma white men, creating different levels of well-being within one republic in which, for Martino, wealth should be um, equally distributed. Secondly, it reduces moral agency. So people don't act following morality and justice, but only trying to pursue more wealth and power. This also creates an anxiety and limits reflections, according to Martino thought. Perfect. So the last part of the project is about feminism. We already uh, we have already seen how Martino speaks about women, highlighting them being dominated by men. But let's go a little bit deeper into the topic. So first and foremost, Martino uses a gendered stand standpoint. Being a woman, she writes and does sociology as one, both self-consciously and unconsciously, and putting women in the center of her works. In Society in America, she wrote, it has been frequently mentioned to me that my being a woman was a disadvantage, but then points out how women have advantage in social research. And that is why, uh, and that is because they ac have access to domestic life, which is a strategic site for the study of morals and manners. In another chapter of Society in America called Political Non-Existence of Women, she traces the history of women's lack of civil rights and um, asking herself if women could ever be really considered politically in the USA, even if the Declaration of Independence in theory announces the complete equality between men and women, this equality doesn't really exist. Um, well, the answer she gives herself is no, basically, <laughs> and that is because uh, the argument people, uh, and that is because of the argument Americans give when talking about gender inequality. So basically, Americans always say that um, women are not considered equally uh, equally as men because women agree with the position they are in. Responding to that, Martino says that this is, uh, first of all, is a proof of, of degradation of women and the domination of women, uh, um, and the domination of women in the society. And second of all, this argument is only partially true because women sometimes are convinced that they cannot aim to something more, to have a more relevant posi position in society. She also said that at the same time, there are plenty of women that agree with her and that have not, and that have been trying her whole, uh, their whole life to get validated, to be considered equal to men. So the fact that a lot of women agree with the, um, with the, with the point that women uh, are fine being dominated by men is basically a proof of patriarchy that convinced them that convinced them that to be less important. Martino's social theory foc focuses on the question: Are women present? Are they truly free? To answer this question, she investigates women's uh, life and work to investigate domination and inequality. She portrays women as active members of society and explores various types of um, women's paid labor, such as um, domestic service, female industry, and modern domestic service. Also, when she focuses on abolitionist efforts, she does that through the lens of the annual report of um, female anti-slavery society. So basically, this association was formed as a result of the inability of women to become members of the male abolitionists organization. And this organization focused uh, on circulation of anti-slavery pet petitions, holding public meetings, organizing fundraising efforts, and financially, financially supporting communities' improvement 
um, community improvement for free for free black women and men. Um, in her studies um, of women's work, she uses statistical data. This particular method of analysis is fundamental in positive philosophy. This is how we see Martineau um, invested in positivism. Using statistics, she proved that um, she proved she proved the relevance of women in work, economy, and society, highlighting all limitations women experience in is experience in their life due to patriarchal practices. She also focused on the interconnections between uh, intercon uh, in interconnections between among limited employment uh, opportunities, forced marry marriage, and uh, male jealousy of women workers. Um, Martino don't talk, don't only talk about differences in treatment between men and women, but she also talks about differences between within women, especially when analyzing uh, domestic work. Um, and she does that one more time, adopting the intersectional point of view, as we already talked about it. But um, when talking um, when talking of, uh, about differences among women, she explores interactions between employers and employees, uh, white women and and black women. So ba basically, she studied uh, domestic work. Uh, Looking about look, looking the part where white women were the employ the, the employers and the the black female the uh, the black women were the employees. Uh, overall, her feminist sociology brings together gender, class, and ethnicity. So, in conclusion. Um, we could describe Martino with many terms. She was liberal, she was feminist, she was an economist, so social worker, positivist. All these are true. But how can we describe Harriet Martino in three words? So it's pretty easy. She simply was a mother of sociology. We could say we could say that thanks to her help, sociology, sociology is the discipline it is today. So um, I really thank you for your attention. This is, was it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and bye. See you.